other ones that we add, uh, I would say, because as uh, people now know uh, about the project, Open Earth Monitor, it's mostly a, a very heavily use case based project. And in this case, we are going to present a study that is part of a use cases, of one of these use cases. And not only uh, I'm presenting because I'm part of the consortium, but we also have the stakeholders present to share the discussions about how the use cases worked over time. So, please. Yeah. And just to clarify, I'm not the stakeholder. I'm representing the stakeholder today, but <laughs> okay, delegated. Yeah, exactly. So good morning, everyone. And as Carmelo said, we are going to present this uh, a couple of case study on uh, on this machine learning model we have developed for mosquito monitoring uh, in support of mosquito monitoring and control. Um, we focus on tiger mosquito, and we will guide you through uh, a couple of examples. And we are not focusing too much on the meat. We are focusing also on the methods, and Carmelo then will go a bit more into the details um, of, of it. Um, well, Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquitoes. I'm, I'm sh yeah, yeah, a bit closer, better. Okay, um, the tiger mosquito. I'm sure you have heard of it. Uh, it's pretty nasty. It bites. Um, but it can also spread uh, diseases. Um, the species has uh, a subtropical region from uh, Southeast Asia, and then starting from the mid uh, of 20th century, start to be uh, brought uh, in other parts of the world due to human movements of goods and people. And it is present in, in Europe since the uh, late 80s, and uh, was, was first introduced in Albania, and then Northern Italy, and from there it spreads uh, all over, all over uh, the Europe. Um, we already had several uh, diseases outbreaks due to um, these species. Um, th th this map is a, a bit old, but we had also other uh, cases in the um, in 2020, 2020 to 2024. Um, so, to control this population, there are significant significant resources that are located at the local scale to monitor uh, the population dynamics and then con control it. So d using treatments like uh, uh, larvicides, uh, adulticides in case of breaks, uh, outbreaks and so on. Uh, the problem is that the funds and uh, personnel available is, is limited as, as always. And um, so um, an old <laughs> uh, idea is to use models to integrate um, monitoring surveillance activities, what is called a passive surveillance system. And so we, we design this, we use this machine learning model to infer the abundance and seasonality of Aedes albopictus in a portion of s Southern Europe, okay, first. Uh, as you know, we have different modeling approach to, to model species distribution and abundance. We have correlative approaches uh, where we have a dependent variable, dependent variables as covariates and alg different algorithms. You can use it to, to build, um, this is a pointer, or, oh, but anyway, uh, uh, okay, sorry, uh, to build um, species distribution models like maps or abundance maps. And what we are focusing today is on abundance maps, but the problem is that we have many algorithms and it can be difficult to choose one of them because you can get very different results according to different algorithms. So what at a certain point started emerging in the literature was the use of ensemble models where you try to uh, can, can to get fit the, the data on different uh, data sets and then um, try to combine them in a, in a, in a, in a, on a final prediction that takes into account all the different uh, m models. In this case, is the dashed line uh, of the scatter plot. Uh, essentially, what we do, we take uh, our, mod our data set, we train different models, we get different prediction, and then we take a simple average, or a weighted average as um, output. But um, there are um, better methods. Uh, one of these is called stacked um, machine learning, uh, where we L1 means uh, base learner or learner level one. We train different uh, models, we get different predictions. Then we take the same response variable and we put it into the meta model, so a second level learner, and we use the prediction of the base learner to inform the meta models. And this has been shown to be uh, to work pretty pretty well. Carmelo did a paper about it a couple of years ago. And while it increased predictive accuracy, on the other hand, we, lo we lose completely the causal aspect because we are using the prediction of other algorithms to inform a second model. And still, there are some uh, 
some promises. Uh, so there is some explainable AI um, methods that can improve this lack uh, of um, interpretability. But yeah, it's not the uh, focus of today. Um, so, in first case study, we try to infer the abundance and seasonality of this albopictus in a portion of southern Europe using this stuck motion morning monitor to support monitoring surveillance activities. First, I have to talk about uh, the data collection. So, we contact several stakeholders um, around Italy, Albania, and uh, France and Switzerland, and we start collecting raw ovitraps uh, observation. Ovitraps are these uh, buckets, uh, plastic buckets, you can, a pot, filled with water, and you put this stick inside, and essentially mosquito, female mosquito, when they look for a, um, a place where uh, ovi deposit eggs, they look for breeding sites with water, and they land on the sticks, and they deposit uh, the, the eggs. And uh, after a certain amount of time, usually every week or two weeks, an operator pass by, collect the, 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 the stick, chain the stick, and count the single eggs. And this give, gave us a, a sort of index of population dynamics, okay? So we collect this data, but you know what? <laughs> different stakeholders collect the data, the ovi, uh, collect the ovitrap with different ovitraps, with di uh, size, with different revisiting time, and so on. So we need to find a way to standardize all these kind of things. So first, we try to use, a, instead of a bi-weekly or three-weekly um, temporal coverage, we try to disaggregate on the temporal basis. And so we use this, called this temporal downscaling, where essentially we uh, randomly allocate some of the eggs accordingly to the number of weeks in which the, uh, the trap was active. Which means that, as you can see in the first example, if your trap was active for two weeks and you collected 500 eggs, you, you run a random binomial draw with a probability of 50% oh, in this case, because you have two weeks. And, um, and you allocate uh, 246 on the first week and 254 on the second one. Okay? And see the nice thing of this, this approach, which is stochastic in a sense, uh, is that you keep uh, the um, seasonal distribution of your observations. The other thing is that often you don't, want to, you don't sample in November, December, January, and February because usually you don't have mosquitoes. So here, where, when we had zeros, which means that when you had observations, we put the observations. When we didn't have the observations, we, we said that safely, November, December, January, and February, we uh, don't have mosquitoes. So we decided we impose zero in this, uh, in this case. Um, when we don't have um, observation, well, we might have the species such as March and April, we left an A if no observation were available, as you can see in this case. So we finally, we did all this procedure of, disaggreg of disaggregation, temporal disaggregation, on each of the traps, you can see the small dots there. But then there was a quite a lot, I mean, there is a bit of uh, environmental heterogeneity, microclimatic effects, and so on. And so we decided to do a crude spatial average using a grid of 10 kilometers. Why 10 kilometers? Because it's the native spatial resolution of ERA 5 land um, data set, which was very handy then for FIT uh, to inform the model. So here we have, uh, we, we got, we, now we had uh, 150 aggregated of traps covering the whole area uh, with uh, 42,000 observations. We, have, we kept all the information that we could and we published a paper uh, on scientific data a couple of months ago. So having this um, training data set, we also select a couple of covariates, as I said before, ERA5, which are missed mostly Weekly median temperature, weekly median photo period, so the length of the day. Weekly cumulative precipitation with the several legs. So we use uh, like the cumulative precipitation over two, three, four, five weeks and so on. And the temperature was the same. Plus we had this thing that uh, was pretty helpful in de depicting the, um, the behavior uh, of the seasonality of this other response variable and the mosquito of course. 
which is a simply uh, Fourier decomposition on the response variable, uh, which helps detecting the trend. Um, so here we are, we have a orbital data set, environmental covariates. We have a training data set where we split on the internal validation data set and an external validation data set. I come to back to this uh, pretty soon. We formulate uh, our model. We use four different base learners, XGBoost, BRT, Boosted Regression Trees, Random Forest, and Cubist. And as a meta learner, we use a linear model. We predict and we assess uh, our um, uh, our results over the uh, against the observations. As I said, we had an internal validation, so we use uh, we train. Sorry, we train the model on 100, uh, 120 station with observations spanning from 2010 to 2021. Then we um, for the internal validation, so on those uh, 120 uh, station, 61 were used for internal validations on 2022 only. And then we use only uh, also an external validation. So we removed 20 uh, stations. There were those here, the, the green dots here, that they had at least three years of observation and were not used to inform the model. In addition, we also run an internal cross validation. And yeah, before we go to the result, I let the floor to Carmel. So since it's a, a workshop should be technical, so I would like to give you a brief excursion on uh, which kind of framework we use to develop all of this. This is one, uh, one our framework to develop machine learning models in the R programming language, uh, MLR3. There are others like tidy models or tidy R or the old one is Caret. This is one of the most new one still in development. And what it allows you is that contrary to other previous framework, you can create modular pipelines of all the pre-processing and processing and training, etc., cetera, uh, components of the machine learning modeling pipeline. Uh, in this way, you have different libraries where you have the different components. So based on the things that you want to include in your full pipeline, you can load one or more libraries. And it's easy to compare different models across the same training session. And yeah, it's really, uh, I think it's really intuitive. Uh, but the, the only difference is that compared to traditional R objects, or if you're a programmer that is used to, uh, like, uh, you know, use the R programming languages, is more comparable to Python. They introduce this new abstract class, and everything is a bit more, less intuitive, let's say, to, to work with, if you are, if you are not uh, introduced to object-oriented type of languages. And that's why I, re I try to rebuild the workflow that Daniele was showing before in a way that it's compatible with the terminology of MLR3. So, yeah, the pointer doesn't work, so, ah, no, it works, you see? Okay, no. Ah. Anyway, so basically you start with your training data set, your input where you have your target variable and the, co the environmental covariates we were looking at before. And anything that is a machine learning model to solve in this framework is called by MLR3 as a task. So it can be a regression task, like in this case, where you're trying to fit and find something, and in this case, we are finding the abundance of the eggs across space and time. Or it can be a classification problem, a clustering analysis, it depends. Then you use learner, so basically that's where you initialize the structure of the algorithms that you would like to use. So based on, for example, hyperparameters, if you already have them set, or uh, sampling strategy, and so on and so forth. Then this uh, uh, fourth component, the tuner, is something that you may not be needing. Like for example, if you use uh, models like random forests that are quite uh, good from the, the get-go, they don't need additional fine-tuning. But in case you would need that, for example, for the boosted trees that we saw before, uh, you would have to set an hyperparameter space where you have to look for the best combination of hyperparameters of your model and then the tuning conditions that can vary. It can be a random search, it can be a grid search, and so on and so forth. So after training the model, uh, these two things that you see here on the bottom are one is the resampling strategy, which is used to conduct the internal validation on those 60 stations that uh, Daniele was mentioning before. And then the prediction uh, method instead is used to predict the, your trained model on the test set and then finally the external validation. So to have just some uh, tidy bit of code <laughs> that you can have a look at. 
Uh, this is the abstract base class task that I was mentioning before. So in this case, you just use this one single line of code to assess what's the target inside the data set, so the column that has the abundance, in this case, like abundance. And then you can assign an ID to the task if you have, for example, multiple tasks in the same pipeline so that you know what you're looking at. And in this case, the spatial location of the stations was important for the cross-validation strategies because we were using uh, uh, spatial block cross-validation. So that means that during the cross-validation strategies, observations that were included more or less in the same 10-kilometer tile block were uh, compared across uh, stations that were further away from each other. So in that way, you try to include uh, in the refitting of the different models some type of regional information without having to mix them all together like a standard cross-validation where each row is uh, treated independently and maybe you are checking your model on two points that are next to each other. So you train on one point and you test on the point that is just next door. The learner, as you said, is how you initialize these, these models. So in this case, you're just initializing a generalized boosted models and you uh, infer what's the predict type based on the type of task that you are going through. And in this case, we have something that is a stacked model. So as we said, we have different level one models that, and then the predictions, the out of bag predictions of these four models are then used to train the final linear model. So it's actually, a little bit more complicated to set it up. Uh, and then, for example, you have uh, for some models like uh, Random Forest or RegiBoost, you can actually run them in parallel. So you can also specify the number of threads that each algorithm needs to use. And this is like MLR3 also provides you the option to visualize the uh, modeling framework that you're trying to use. So in this case, uh, this this whole thing, you can actually plot it inside R. You can just like, like run one line of plot and then this is how your framework for the modeling uh, works. Uh, so this is instead the tuner, as I said, this is another class and is used to uh, uh, define the search space and then to initialize the hyperparameter tuning. So here in this case, we are just showing a couple of parameters for uh, the random forest, so we're just put in number of trees, the M tries, and this FTS is basically the number of features that the model has. Uh, and this is instead how you conduct the tuning. So you run a single instance, you select the task, you select your model, how many resampling strategies you want to put, on which measure you want to optimize your model. This is RMSC, but you can put R squared, or you know, there's a uh, nth list of measures in the dictionaries that you can check. Yeah, also. Then the search space that we defined before, and then how many evaluations, so in this case, 10. And yeah, and then you just initialize it. So you can run it in parallel, and in this case, we just use a random search inside the whole search space that we defined before. And finally, we have the training of the model and the testing of the model. So in this case, we just take the parameters that have been found at the end of the hyperparameter tuning session, we assign them to the graph of the model that we created before, and then you just train the model. And finally, you can do the internal validation with using the resample class, and in this case, you just define how many folds you want to use, what type of strategy you want to use, and, uh, and then you initialize everything, and you can have the results, the final results of the cross-validation. You can get the results on aggregate, of course, of all the 10 iterations, and you will get the total RMSC and the total R square. And this is instead finally for the uh, external validation. So you just do a prediction on the data set that you created before with these 20 observations that we kept, with 20 stations we kept out. And then you can do exactly the same. Everything is stored inside the same class in the same binding so you do not have uh, like normal R objects list nested inside other lists. They actually are quite heavy but are rather more like pointers, so it's uh, also quite easier on memory. And yeah, you can introduce the results. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, the results, um, the nice thing, I mean, in ecological modeling, I don't know if you are used to, but the R square usually is very low. <laughs> so I mean, we were already quite happy to see that the, the um, stack machine learning model already got uh, 63%, uh, 0 0.63 of R square, which is 
for ecological modeling is pretty high in terms of predictive accuracy. Um, the residual standard, standard errors and the uh, tenfold uh, CVR RMC are already 50, around 50 eggs um, error over the whole time series. So also in this case was not too bad to have 50. Of course, it depends in the area where you are because in over the Alps where you expect to have less eggs during the season, so 50 eggs might be a lot. If you are in the middle of Po Valley where you have maybe 700, 800 mosquitoes, 50 eggs might be decent. Uh, still, as you can observe from the RMIC or, or the mean, uh, mean absolute error, still the train validation, uh, sorry, the train data set, of course, always get the lowest um, RMIC, but the nice thing is that there is no statistical difference between the internal validation and external validation. So, the, again, the internal validation was performed only on the year 2022 while the external validation was performed on the whole time series on stations that were not used to inform the model. Uh, and here are the, uh, the time series results. I had to aggregate, uh, so the hundreds of, uh, of stations by biogeographical regions. So I used the Alpine, continental and Mediterranean biogeographical areas. Uh, the, f the first line, the upper line, is the internal validation. So in uh, light blue, you have, so in, in gray, you have the observation, and in light blue, you have the, tra the, predi the prediction on the train data set, and you see that we kind of nicely get the seasonality of the observations. Uh, the yellow one is the internal validation on the year 2022 only. And again, you see that uh, there is, uh, it, it met, they match. Um, on the low, well, the lowest line, the second line, is the external validation. And also here, the nice thing is that on the continental one, uh, works pretty well. Spoiler alert, we have more observation on the continental um, bioge biogeographical uh, region. On the Alpine, so and so, but we have less data. And on the Mediterranean, again, uh, was pretty, pretty okay. Um, this is just an insight, again, on the external uh, validation data set disaggregated not only by, by geographical region, but also by um, uh, region. So in this case, we see that, for example, in the Alpine area, in Switzerland, in the canton of Ticino, and in the autonomous province of Trento, the temporal trends were quite okay. In Veneto, for example, uh, northeast Italy, uh, the predictions were not good at all. But we have very, very low observed uh, values. For Emilia-Romagna, uh, in, in, um, in uh, the continental um, area, it, it, worked, it worked pretty well. And as well in Lazio, Lazio region in, in the Mediterranean area. Um, so we we decide to predict to get maps because we, we love maps and and voila uh, we got a spatial temporal uh, dynamics of the uh, of the position activity of the tiger mosquito for the year 2022. Um, so for the Open Earth Monitor project that we developed a um, tool so that should be used to in support of public health but you can tell yep. a bit more. So we developed a tool that, according to the use cases, the, there is one that is specific for the Emilia-Romagna region in Italy, which is the uh, stakeholder of the use case. But uh, given that to have better, uh, let's say, predictions and have uh, a better results on, a, on the overall approach and model, we did this aggregation and the collection of all the data across Italy and, uh, sim and the close by regions like in Svizzera and Albania. And this is a, an, an app that you can check on the uh, GitHub of the Open Earth Monitor repository. And in, in this app, you can uh, have both the national overview and uh, later on in the slides, you will see the one for the Emilia-Romagna use case. And uh, in this case, yeah, uh, you can go forward. You can, uh, like we, we produce this uh, preprint uh, that is currently in review with uh, about all the modeling components. And uh, like talking about the results, maybe I can also like uh, anticipate some of the questions about the, the R square. Like it's also low because we decided not to include other covariates that could improve the performances of the model. Uh, just because the, uh, the whole point of the use case is to have a tool that is capable to forecast. 
So if we would include things like, for example, satellite imagery, we would not be able to forecast with two weeks or three weeks before what would be the number of eggs and then identify which one would be the uh, regions that are most at risk to encounter mosquitoes. Uh, yeah, you can go forward. Yeah, so um, once, once we, um, I mean, we wrote this paper as a proof of con concept of the, of the methodology, so we decided to go to the second uh, case study, which was to develop a um, passive surveillance system for the Emilia-Romagna region. So um, in this case, instead of working at 10K, we use the same raw database as before. We do all the, the temporal downscaling, uh, post-processing, and blah, blah, blah. But instead of aggregating at 10 kilometers, we aggregated the, the OVI job at five kilometers because we use finer environmental data which, which were provided by the Regional Environmental um, Agency of Emilia-Romagna. So again, two objectives. The first one will train a model on Emilia-Romagna to predict past season, and then the second objective is to use the same model to, to forecast within two weeks. And yeah, we did it. It works. Um, we have uh, our nice temporal, um, spatial temporal uh, behavior. With the uh, be the beginning of the season is usually. Uh, around the middle March, and then we have the peak of season uh, of the seasonal activity of, of the deposition of taken mosquito between the um, late June and beginning of August, and then th and as we know, I mean those who experience the biting of uh, tiger mosquitoes as the cold start. Uh, I mean we start to have uh, colder days than the ovid deposition activity. Uh, decrease. This is the, the standard um, uh, seasonality of, of the species. Oh, this is for the year 21, and we see that if we change, we have a year 22, it's kind of similar. Again, there is a bit of spatial temporal patterns, but I mean, the trend is that one. But in trend, uh, and I mean, as Carmelo was saying, then we developed also uh, the same um, app, uh, just we, you click on regional and you get the same. Um, prediction just for Emilia-Romagna in this case. Uh, we, we use province here uh, just as a proof of concept probably for, um, to implement this and make it a, an operational tool we maybe might, might have to work at um, sub-province uh, sub, uh, uh, scale maybe at municipality level. Um, but yeah, spatial prediction on 2022 again, I said it was working pretty nice, but in 2023, we noticed something weird, especially on week uh, 20 in May, we had a sudden drop of the uh, of the positional activity, and I mean, it was, was a bit weird to say why, but I mean, we had floods. So the interesting thing was that the model was able to detect the um, high, heavy rainfall that have a flushing effect on the uh, eggs that are generally uh, deposit uh, on, on, the, um, on the breeding site. So we say, okay, nice, it works. So what about trying to uh, try to estimate um, the, the, the next two weeks uh, so, and use it as, um, as a forecast um, tool? And so we use our model, we use uh, ARPE, so the Regional uh, Environmental Agency estimates uh, for temperature and precipitation, every week they run, a downscale, they downscale uh, the um, the forecast made by um, uh, the ECMF, uh, ECM, thank you, uh, ECMWF, uh, and they provide estimates for the next four weeks. And we know that the first two weeks are kind of um, of reliable. After the, sec the, the, the on the third we weeks onward is science fiction. Um, so we, but in the, in, we, we use it again. And so we got our nice uh, plot for the prediction for, for the season. And uh, so we get the prediction for June, July, and August. And we like kind of happy. But then we said, oh, it's miss there is a slide missing. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I mean. So when we validate it, we, we noticed that, uh, can you, maybe can you exit the presentation mode and I just uh, show this, uh, this slide? No. 
can you can you exit from the presentation mode? Yeah. Yeah. Super. Wow. And you you go to slide sixty, please, which I forgot to uh, unhide. unhide. Yes. <laughs> you just go to slide sixty, please. Uh, the ones here that I forgot to un unhide. Sixty. And we try to validate then the model with the uh, with the OV traps, okay? So, and what we saw is that the model is not working so good. So we have the three columns are the, the June, July, and August, and the rows are different cities, okay? So there is quite a lot of um, variability, uh, and we still have to understand why. Uh, so. Working, wor work in progress. Uh, the only thing I can say is that the, we d we use the predictions every week, uh, every month. We just use for uh, the, the forecast on the four next uh, weeks, okay? Because the agreement with the environmental agency was like, okay, you send us the data once once per month. So maybe this can explain the poor performance, especially. Uh, on the third weeks uh, onward, but we are still uh, investigating uh, this. And uh, yeah, in conclusion, um, uh, we, we feel that stacking is a robust uh, method for forecasting and for spatial temporal approaches. Um, still, we need to investigate a bit this thing. Um, it's a predictive approach, so I don't think it's appropriate for, for causal inference. And, uh, and still, uh, I mean, it's a very cool uh, method, but uh, again, it, uh, it comes with all the problems of all uh, models, right? So if you don't have good data, <laughs> it doesn't work so well, and if you have bias in your data, still it is uh, influenced. Uh, thank you. And I will also, uh, we have to also have to, to thank all the departments that were involved in the collection of, uh, of the data because uh, without them it would have been not be possible to do this uh, this kind of exercises thanks